Thank you all for joining us today. You'll notice that I'm not Amanda Price, who is meant to be moderating the session this afternoon. We are always conscious of ensuring we have a gender balanced session where possible, but unfortunately Amanda was not able to join us. Before we begin, and on behalf of all those present, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the traditional custodians of this land. I pay my respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here with us today. For those of you I have not met, my name is Fabio Carnavali and I'm from the High Growth Ventures team. We are a unit within KPMG that works with founders specifically to help them build sustainable and scalable startups. We uh, have developed a range of services specifically designed and priced for founders, starting from pre-Series A onwards. Now, a big thank you to everyone who submitted questions as a part of the registration process. This was by far and away the highest number of questions that we've actually received for a Q&A, which I think really speaks to the importance of the topic that we're going to be diving into in just a moment. Now, we have done our best to include as many of them in the session. However, I'd encourage you to um, to please. Oh, make something to, oh um, Kelly, do you want to just jump on that? I think we're having a, a pickle with one of the guests. Now, as we go through the different topics, I would encourage you to ask um, questions along the way just in the chat function and we'll do our best to get to them um, the best we can. Now the topic for today's Q&A is founder finances, the personal finance considerations every startup founder should know. We have structured the session to cover the key milestones a founder is likely to face on their journey. So we're going to be starting with ensuring that you're getting the basics right at the beginning. And then as you sort of progress through the founder journey, what do things look like um, as you consider taking money off the table along the way? And then finally, we'll finish up with what some sort of exit event might look like. Now we have got a couple of bonus topics at the end if we manage to get through, um, get through the questions. We are joined by four people who are extremely well qualified to explore this topic with us today. We've got Rachel Witt, a partner here at KPMG, Josh Geelan, another partner and our national ESG lead, Ian Beatty, managing partner and co-founder at Second Quarter Ventures, and Mark Woodland, founder at Kismet Healthcare. A very big and warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. Now, in terms of introductions, Josh, I was thinking we actually start with you, given you've actually been on both sides of this panel, having gone through that founder journey and now obviously helping founders build their businesses. So I might hand over to you. Oh, uh, Josh, you're just on mute there. Wow, we're off to a good start. Look, great to see you all. Uh, apologies for for that. Um, I've probably got an untypical background of a big four partner. Um, so I've been a founder three times. Um, first one was back in 2013. I'll share some insights on that later in today's session. That was over in the US uh, and two here in Australia, one just before coming to KPMG. Um, so my role, as Fabio said, I work with high growth ventures, family offices, private businesses as their uh, outsourced CFO and also that national ESG uh, role as well. So look, great to see you all here and I uh, hope we can ask your curly questions. Amazing. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Rachel, would you like to jump in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Fabio. Uh, just a quick just a quick one. Also, I'm coming today from Gold Coast. So I'm on the land of the Yugumba people. So I pay my respects to elders past and present here also. Um, so I work with startups and scale-ups as well as um, established private businesses, similar to Josh work in that mid-market space, uh, working with um, the, the owners of the businesses and not just the businesses themselves. So I think that's what's really awesome from our side. We get to to work with people on their tax accounting, outsource CFO things, not just from the business side, but really helping to drive the founders and the, the individuals behind the business and what they want to achieve in their own ambitions from a personal perspective as well. So I really enjoy working with those type of clients. Amazing. Thank you, Rachel. Lucky to have you here. Um, Ian, would you like to jump in? Oh, Ian, uh, you're just on mute there. Again, uh, sorry, another bad start there. Um, my name, I'll repeat, my name is Ian. Uh, I'm a co-founder managing partner of, of Second Quarter Ventures. Um, we're a venture liquidity fund. So what that means is 
we uh, we transact in in secondary transactions. We allow uh, founders, employees, early shareholders, even some uh, professional technology investors like venture venture capital investors. We we allow these type of stakeholders uh, to take uh, money off the table along their their private market journey. So uh, before you know, before uh, we we came uh, onto the scene in Australia a few years ago. Um, there was really very much a, a sort of a pathway, a long-term pathway to trade, sale, or exit um, from you know, from T zero um, and up to sort of ten years. So, um, what our liquidity allows people to do is uh, actually um, give them a tax problem along that journey. Uh, so, uh, normally, um, normally the the tax advisors come in after we've transacted, um, but often um, and, and more sort of more frequently that is changing. That the that uh, founders and the people we transact with get uh, get advice before we actually uh, help them uh, realize some of the value they've created. Amazing, thank you, Ian. And I know we're going to be taking a bit of a deeper dive into some of the areas you touched on later. Now, Mark, would you like to wrap up the introductions, and we'll go from there? Yeah, thanks, um, Mark Woodland, founder of Explore, which was a still is a childcare software platform. Um, grew grew incredibly quickly, launched in 2016, then was acquired in 2020. Um, then I had the opportunity to be um, founder of a new company called Kismet, which is trying to make healthcare a little bit more accessible. Um, so hopefully can answer a few questions from that founder perspective and all the lessons or all the things that I got wrong, you won't have to. Amazing, thank you, Mark. Now we might actually stay with you for a minute it would be great to get, I guess, a bit of a deeper dive into your founder's story. Obviously, your previous business you managed to sell out of very successfully, and it would be good to sort of hear from some of the key lessons you took away from that. I know in, in recent discussions you and I have had, you didn't necessarily come from that business or technical background, and so I can only imagine that it was quite a steep learning curve for you uh, in such a short period of time. Yeah, I'll try and give a super brief uh, uh, story. But my mum, she was a school teacher, um, and so this was in 2010. She decided to retire. Um, and for technology perspective, 2010 was when the iPad first came out. So that's when we can cast our mind back to. Um, so it's still pretty early days. Uh, but my mum was a great teacher, still is a great teacher today. But she didn't. I would have massive arguments with her about. Um, she would say to me well, I don't have time to pay the rent because I'm teaching the children. And I would say, well, you won't have any children to teach if you don't pay the rent. So massive conflict there. Um, and so those super passionate people are always focused on what they signed up to do. So I left the army, um, zero business experience, zero understanding, no idea what a VC was, um, and went into the family business just to do admin and saw a problem there where super passionate people were no longer able to do what they loved because they spent the majority of their time chasing fees, chasing invoices, collecting enrollments. So over the years, we grew our childcare centers and I thought that would be my journey. Um, but during this process, I started building software with the grand statement of how hard could it be? Uh, and I still regret that to this day. But um, yeah, big, big statements, very, very steep learning curve. But in 2016, um, Airtree, so Daniel Petrie re reached out and said, hey, very interested in your business. I sent a pretty rude email back saying, I'm not interested in spam, please go away. Um, and then he responded saying, I'm not sure you realize who I am. And then the rest is history. So they um, came in in 2016 and helped us grow the business. But we grew very quickly during 2016. And I remember people early days saying, hey, you need to get this sorted. You need to set up your structures. You need to understand the process of what an exit might look like. And for me, I didn't even know what the definition of an exit was. Um, so I would always kick the can down the road and say, hey, this is not anything needed for me right now. Um, I'll deal with it later. And for me, later was four years later, which is a pretty short period. And all of a sudden, I was wishing I did all these things that everyone warned me not to, uh, warned me to do, um, but I didn't. So <clears throat> in 2020, my company was acquired by private equity, um, Advent International, great bunch of um, private equity team. Um, and then for the last sort of two years, I've been working with them um, and understanding that side of the business. Um, and then I had the opportunity to leave um, and, and start Kismet, which is just trying to make healthcare a bit more accessible. But um, 
Yeah, definitely advice is uh, do things as early as possible, even if you're not thinking of an exit. For me personally, I didn't want to jinx it and think of exits, even though, you know, I, I knew Explore was going to be great. I know Kismet's going to be a superstar, but it's more just thinking into the future and then sort of living in this future that isn't reality and sometimes having to come back to the present. Um, this is probably one of the ones you could, you could definitely uh, focus on and there's great people that will speak about that. So that's my story. Um, very brief advice. Amazing. Thank you, Mark. And curious to hear, when did the penny drop for you when you realised that you may not have set things up in the most effective way possible? Um, it was definitely during the signing of documents because DD was a blur um, travelling yep. around the world trying to get DD done. So that was the focus. And for me, it's always just trying to focus on what the most urgent thing is. And that was the urgent thing. And then things, you know, you get through DD, you get through this, you get through that. And all of a sudden it's, ah, oh, I need to think about myself for 30 seconds instead of uh, shareholders and investors and the team and the company. And at that point, it's probably, oh, I probably should have done this first. And it's that selfish moment that you think, well, everyone's going to have to wait until I put my attention onto this um, and get that sorted. So I don't know. It's always a tricky one to launch your startup with this intent mm. of you're going to exit at X amount. Um, and it's sort of that imposter syndrome because maybe it's not worth that. But for me, it was just, well, I'll deal with it when it comes. But I don't recommend that strategy. So in a way, it was sort of crunch time, and this is probably the last thing you want to be thinking about going through such a stressful, uh, stressful event. Yeah, there's a lot you do um, as a founder, and and usually it's your last on that list of things that need to be done. So that's just the way it happened. Amazing. And Rachel, I might turn to you as I'd be curious to hear how a founder should think about getting the basics right from the very beginning. But also, where do you often see founders going wrong and what do they sometimes misinterpret when getting their businesses off the ground? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Fabio. Um, I think there's, there's multiple things and Mark definitely touched on a few of them. So um, I'm not going to go into detail there, but intent is a massive thing, right? Like, so we all start out something and you want to grow it and you want to do something with it. But what is your actual intention? What is your exit strategy like? Um, different people have different things. So I think first comment is you can't rock up and someone tells you this is how you should structure it and that will work for every single founder and every single startup. Like everyone's a little bit different. It depends on your intentions. It depends on where you think you want to exit or you might not want to exit and how you're going to grow that. So I think that's definitely an important point is around considering what your intentions are um, and your advisors can work with you as to how to structure something. So Whilst your intentions are at the forefront, we're always mindful that intentions can change. So it's about us having building in the flexibility to a structure that will allow you to to kind of pivot if something does change from from what your initial intention was. Um, there's also something to consider in respect to if you've got one founder versus multiple founders. Obviously, if it's just yourself, you kind of just hitting the round ground running and you're and you're going with the flow and just everything yours is the businesses and it it's just all hands on deck. Um, if you've got multiple founders, there's there's more things you need to think about. Like you need to think about from an ownership structure, how much equity percentage is everyone going to get? What factors are going into that conversation as to what what percentage you, you're going to contribute? Is it just based on cash? Is it potentially based on what you're contributing from an IP perspective um, and what you're going to contribute on a day-to-day -day basis versus kind of just maybe a silent partner in the background? So there's lots of little things you should think about um, that can build the structure. Um, when we start to talk with clients around um, structures, it's and people are like, oh, I'll just... I don't know what I'm doing yet. I'm just going to run as a sole trader or as a partnership with two people and, and we'll go from there and figure it out later. Going back to Mark's point, like let's just let's just think about two or three steps down the chain and where might be a better position. Um, I know one of the questions coming through, Fabio, and some of the questions we get asked is, oh, why do I need to set up a company with a discretionary trust underneath if my kids are really young and and I haven't really got to the point yet of, of thinking about who I'm going to distribute it to? Why don't I just set it up with me and my spouse owning the shares 
shares ourselves and a lot of the time we'll run a company report and you'll see two shares owned by two different people and, and kind of that's it. And I guess that comes back to the flexibility point. Um, if you if that's your structure from the start, that's kind of your structure from the start. If you though go then sign a multi-million dollar contract, you're kind of stuck with how that's going to get taxed at the back end. Whereas if we can build in a bit of flexibility, we've got some room to move when we start to consider your exit. Um, I think also some of the things to think about right at the start is how much cash are you putting in as, an, as a founder? Again, if there's multiple founders, how much cash is coming in and how is it coming in? Are you building that as equity of the business and, and then that's going to form part of the company? Or are you expecting to put that in as a loan because you might want to pull that out early or depending on how people like Ian might um, fund something, is it going to be something that you want to get out quickly so you want to do it as a loan rather than as equity? So there is things to think about from that cash side as well. Um, I think um, one of the things with multiple founders is to have a written agreement in place. A lot of people say, oh, no, they're my best mate. I'll be fine. We, this is going to be great. We're going to do great. This is everything that's going to happen. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. So having a backstop of a document to say, right, what do we actually do when something goes wrong, rather than having to deal with it later, having to deal with conflict, um, if you've got a document in place that can kind of step through how, how you're going to get through some of those conflicts, I think that's really important. Um, I feel like I could go on forever, Father. Yeah. But if you've got a few, if you've got a few questions, I guess I do. We we actually yeah. received some questions that were really around that sort of similar vein or that topic, and one of them was one of the areas that you sort of touched on was how can a founder protect personal assets if things do indeed go horribly, horribly wrong? What should that picture look like? Yeah, I th look, I think it comes down to the investment of, of what you're putting through and how you're doing it. Um, I think from an asset protection perspective, obviously having a company in place provides some protection for you as an individual. Um, in saying that as a director, you do still have some liabilities. So I'll just flag that for future as well. But um, I think it's really important to know what's the difference between what you as a person is developing in your wealth and your future and Josh can definitely touch on this in respect to the intergenerational wealth piece as well that we both work work in that space as well and just really what are you doing from a family perspective and then what is your specific goals for this business and making sure I think you keep them separate enough that there is that protection between the two and you're not um, say um, potentially having an issue with other personal wealth you might have granted and you don't want to get it wound up into the into the business as well. So I think there's definitely ways we can do that from a structuring perspective um, to keep it all separate. But then there's obviously um, things you've got to think about along the way as well. Like if you go and sign a funding agreement and put a direct <laughs> director's guarantee in place, you're kind of taking away some of that asset protection. So there's definitely things to think about at the start, but then through the process as well. And Rachel, I suppose one of the follow-up questions that one of the attendees has submitted um, in the lead up to the session was really around how should a founder, and you sort of covered it a little bit, how should they think about separating personal and business finances? Because particularly as a business is starting to spin up, I think a lot of the time that can get really blurred really easily. And so yeah. is that something that you see often? And is that obviously something you advise on? Yeah, definitely. I think that comes down to if we start thinking really simplistically, having a zero file or whatever you've got set up from an accounting perspective, separate bank accounts that's running for your business. Um, and every time you do use your personal funds into the business, don't, my suggestion would be don't pay your invoices directly from your personal account, transfer that money in. So it's clear to see that you've loaned the money to the business and then you're using the business funds to, to do any um, kind of expenditure. So I think from a very simplistic perspective, it's it's really about how you manage your bank accounts and how you manage the separation between the two. Amazing, thank you. Now, Ian, I've got some questions for you. Um, as a founder's company really starts to mature, it's building up a bit of momentum. We often hear about the option to take shares off the table via a secondary sale. Are you able to talk to how your team helps founders work through their options around what that might look like? And um, I know that 
that has really changed over the years around the stigma in the market around a founder doing that, particularly from VCs or other types of investors. So we'd also be curious to hear from you around how you think that's changed uh, in, in recent times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank, it's a really good question. So um, there has historically been a, uh, a taboo around uh, founders taking a little bit of money out along the way. Uh, the old school investor approach is, well, we want them, uh, we want to get out first before they can get out and we, we want to keep the founder hungry. We want to keep the employees hungry, all that sort of stuff. Um, thankfully, that, is, that has changed quite substantially um, over the past uh, sort of 15 or so years. Um, I first started looking at secondaries. Uh, well, the first secondary I looked at was, I think it was about 2013. Uh, and that was when I was based in London. And I looked at a around about a 600 million euro slice of Spotify. Uh, so clearly very successful company. And there was various reasons why people who were investors in that company uh, needed to take a little bit off the table as well before the, the IPO. Um, and, you know, from then in, in larger markets, that's sort of when it started to, to really change. Um, in Australia, uh, I think it changed, uh, you know, only a few years ago, um, second quarter as a as a uh, venture secondaries fund is, is relatively new. Our first fund was in 2020, and we really started working deeply on this on this uh, idea in, in sort of 2019. So it is relatively new, but even uh, by the time we uh, started setting second quarter up, um, there was a lot more uh, support from the, some of the really smart venture capital investors in Australia um, about this idea of uh, helping founders and employees have a great journey along the way. So back you know 15 years 20 years ago the average time from uh from sort of company being founded to ipo was was a few years and you know that has ballooned out and i think the average is somewhere around about 13 or 14 years now so that's a really long time to to wait for some theoretical ipo or, or merger or acquisition or something that might or might not happen um along the way i we found that most founders have real bills to pay they don't get paid huge salaries um, often they go through life events like marriage and children um, you know there's classic examples of our liquidity being used to help uh, founders feeling feel secure that they've got a, a house appropriate to their family they know they can pay the rent they know that their kids can go to to whatever school they want to send them to all that sort of thing um, so the the value of uh, of liquidity along the way uh, has been really sort of uh, increasingly recognized over the past few years to the extent that um, uh, I think uh, most uh, most founders will, would agree that when they're able to take a little bit off the table uh, ahead of any exit event, um, it gives them that, that financial security, uh, that courage and fortitude to really make the hard decisions they need to make to create value rather than sitting on some paper wealth saying, gosh, I've got to preserve this. Um, so that's sort of a little bit of a, uh, I, I guess, mm -hmm. history of how, how things have changed over, over the years. Um, we, we are the only specialist uh, venture secondaries fund in uh, the Southern Hemisphere, as far as I'm, I'm aware. There are a few funds that do what we do in the US. Um, in Europe, there are not really any, any funds with our precise model, um, but is a little bit more developed there. Um, we... Uh, our job is to invest in companies via secondary transactions uh, where those companies are a little bit down the track. So they're not quite um, uh, they're not quite seed or very, very early stage. They must have already uh, achieved a uh, some kind of funding from a, a professional technology investor. Usually that's a venture capital fund. Um, there must be at least that first iteration of product market fit. And often that takes the form of revenues. So you know, just as a rough heuristic, you know, when when uh, companies are starting to approach that 10 million uh, uh, Aussie uh, uh, ARR or whatever your revenue model is, that's sort of a good time to talk to uh, a fund like us. Um, so anyone uh, on this on this webinar that is sort of around that that uh, around or above that that stage, uh, we're very happy to to, to speak uh, speak to you guys about what you need. There's a form on our website. We always check it. We've got two portfolio companies as a result of founders filling in that form. So it's actually kind of uh, it's it's actually kind of important for us. Um, 
when uh, when we look at uh, uh, secondary transactions, we sort of make a difference between uh, uh, partial exits, exits, or allowing a sliver off the table. And normally, what we try to do is say, "Hey, let's 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 help those this founder or these employees take a sliver off the table, so they can have that really good journey uh, along along the the private market path." And, uh, and shoot for the shoot for the fences, so to speak. Amazing, thanks, Ian. And I suppose one of the follow-up questions we had, specific to your area and what your team does, was around discounting. So, if a founder does want to explore going through a secondary sale, do you find that they may think that they may have to sell their shares at a potential discount relative to what a VC is about to come in at, or, or what the current value of the business is? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I get asked that a lot. Um, uh, there are all sorts of uh, media articles uh, that I've seen over particularly the past sort of 18 months about these huge discounts in secondaries. Um, but what, and I think I've seen even 60% discounts on some secondaries transactions reported in the media, um, what the media generally fails to include in their, in their, in their pieces is, is the idea of, of, of discount to what? So um, we, we have seen that w when the market was very high a couple of years ago, um, you know, the, the, the uh, value that uh, venture capital investors, including us, were ascribing to, to technology companies was very high because the market was very high. Now it's a little bit lower. So um, it's possible that some secondary transactions have been concluded recently at maybe a 60% discount to the market highs. But then if you look at the public market comparables, most uh, technology stocks are off sort of 50% plus. So it's it's actually, uh, uh, the, the idea of a huge discount is, is not necessarily a thing. Um, there is a discount that often applies, not always, um, but I'll explain a little bit about how that arises. Um, usually by the time we come to look at a, at a, at a company, uh, there's usually, you know, there's a venture capital investor, usually a bunch of friends, family, maybe two VCs, um, angels, maybe some family offices. Um, normally when, uh, these companies are venture back. The venture capital investors will come in with uh, preference shares. So the company will issue them preference shares, which give gives them something called liquidation preferences. Liquidation preferences are, for those that are not familiar, are a preferential return on capital. Almost, uh, it, it's not debt, but it sort of has some elements of debt in that it is a priority return to those investors. Um, we normally buy common stock, or as in, in Australian parlance, uh, ordinary shares. And those ordinary shares are a little bit lower down the pecking order, so they have a far lower uh, priority in terms of, of payout. And so, you know, something that uh, comes with an insurance policy is generally worth a little bit more than something that doesn't come with an insurance policy. So therein lies that, that discount. So often uh, not just secondaries investors, but even venture capital investors, if they were to do a secondary, they will price a little bit differently for common stock versus the latest series of preference shares. So that's where that discount can come in. Um, and in, in our experience, it's nowhere near as big as what is often reported in, in the media. Um, it, I, I doubt we'll ever transact that high. And Ian, maybe a follow-up question to that. Do, if you've got a couple of founders or several founders in a business, do they all opt to, to sell off a part of their holdings for that secondary share sale, or is it often just one? What does that uh, often look like? Uh, it depends. Uh, for, for us as investors, we, uh, we don't mind. Um, it's really the company's business. Um, the founders have generally unique personal needs. Um, so whatever they are uh, within reason, we'll, we'll, we'll support it. Um, so if, if, if one founder wants to take a little bit off the table and the other, Two don't. That's absolutely fine with us. Uh, it really depends on what the company wants to do. But also, we advise strongly uh, every single founder we speak to always speak to your existing shareholders about uh, your need for liquidity because they are really important. They're the they're the people that backed you, you know, and gave the company the fuel uh, to 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 grow when it was very early. And it's really important to sort of have that conversation with your existing investors. Um, before you start going out and, and seeking alternative. It is actually possible that existing investors could provide the, the, the secondary um, liquidity that, that the founder requires. It may, it may not actually be us um, that's required. 
amazing. That's I think that's some really interesting insights. Um, now, Josh, um, I have got a couple for you based on your experience. It would be great to hear about any broader tax considerations a founder should consider when looking at exiting their company, whether that's through a trade sale or an IPO. And I suppose a bit of a follow up question. How should founders think about capital gains tax more broadly as we had so many questions on this topic in and of itself? So I might hand over to you and we can go from there. Thanks, Fabio. And look, I just want to start at sort of stay at the start. Sorry that tax is a good thing. Um, certainly with my second company, I sold for my cost base and therefore made no gain. Um, that gave me a great tax outcome. It was not a good financial outcome. So if you're if you're in a situation where someone is paying you for your business you, and you're exiting in some form and you have a tax problem to deal with, that's a great outcome. The even better outcome is, uh, as Rachel said, having some flexibility in how we manage that for you in a compliant fashion, of course, um, but also that flexibility through the through the model. Also want to say that at, at some point, what we find is, and Rachel and I work with family officers, see this a lot post liquidity events. Founders typically look towards an exit, and that's why you're in the business generally, although sometimes there's other goals there as well. I take that. Up until that point, typically we see motivations around, look, I want to be tax compliant, and I want to get money through this structure out to the stakeholders, tax effectively as possible. However, there comes a time where if you achieve a certain amount of wealth, that flips. So it becomes less about how, how you get money through the structure tax effectively, and more about, I've got more than I need. I don't want all this money coming through to my name personally. And we start to see that detachment from personal wealth and more of that family office construct about how do we preserve this wealth for later generations and therefore retain those funds in the structure or structures tax effectively. So that can change that conversation. And Rachel touched on it before as well around having different setups with, you know, bucket companies and corporate beneficiaries, etc. There's a whole bunch of ways we can do that. But ultimately, if you're looking for a large exit, that becomes a really real thing to plan for now in terms of how we're going to capture that and retain because you don't necessarily want to push it out. You, you want to quarantine it and then reinvest it. So just to do uh, a little bit more of a deep dive, firstly, what is capital gains tax? So when we think about the age old question of what is revenue versus what, it, what is capital gain, it's important to think that a capital gain is effectively a gain you make from selling a capital asset versus revenue, which is from trading. So for example, if you sell your shares in your startup, shares are a capital asset subject to capital gain. Now, if you sell your business from within your company and you see this transpire commonly through uh, IP or business systems, where someone says, look, I don't want your company, I don't want to buy your shares, but I want to buy your IP or some other, your customer base. They buy that from the company, but they don't buy the company. That captures effectively what's a gain, but inside the company, and therefore is revenue and taxed completely differently. So it's really important to think about one structure, like having the IP separate in, in its own company, to give you flexibility about what are we going to sell and to whom? Are we selling the whole company? Are we selling from within the company? Do we need to split those up to give better flexibility around what and where we sell those? Um, now, if you can create a capital gain or get to that position, potentially there are some tax advantages in doing so. For example, the 50% capital gains tax discount. Now, to access that, you need to be effectively be a trust or an individual that is selling that asset. So a company can't get that discount. So if you sell your shares in a company and another company above that owns those shares, that won't happen you can't flow it through to the founders. So there are some other concessions as well. I don't know, we saw a few questions come in around the small business capital gains tax concessions, and there are a number of concessions for small business. But there are also two eligibility criteria at the for, at the forefront of that. Firstly, you need to be a small business. Now, the catch there is that the individual partnership company or trust, depending on how you've got your high growth venture set up, has to have an aggregate turnover of less than $2 million. Now, the catch there is one $2 million, because hopefully we're going to get a greater turnover than that before you exit. But secondly, aggregate means you've got to also include affiliates and connected entities and their turnover in that number. So if you've got some shareholders with large holdings in your startup, 
effectively that can create problems and in some cases they can get added to your turnover which can then rule you out there's also a maximum net asset test of about six million is six million dollars sorry so that can be quite hard unless you're an early stage startup selling basically pre-revenue or, or, or low revenue which obviously certainly happens um, now finally i do want to touch on some broad tax implications for ipos now for those of you who are considering doing an ipo please do come and see us it's extremely complicated from a tax perspective however just to wet the appetite um, there are three main parties who have tax considerations at the IPO, uh, ipo level the first one of course is the company itself then there's the vendors or the owners and then finally the people buying it so think about the company the company will go through historical tax compliance as part of that due diligence process of unlisting there is the potential loss of accumulated tax loss benefits now hopefully at that point there aren't a lot of those or there are none of those but if you do have a stack of accumulated losses what we do see is when you switch to an ipo you would generally but not always fail the same ownership rule so potentially there are some issues there around unlocking that before you go through that process likewise if you do any restructures prior to listing that can have tax tax consolidation and stamp duty to name a few issues at that point before listing for the company now for the owners for the founders and other owners of the business obviously this can potentially trigger a capital gains tax event on disposal as you sell your shares as part of that listing but also potentially can access well you can access rollover relief and therefore defer that tax liability now there are a whole bunch of issues for non-resident vendors in terms of the timing of those gains what those gains look like so for those of you who have foreign shareholders once again great reason to come and uh, seek some proper advice on that and of course many of you have ESOPs and a lot of those will be triggered on exits including IPOs so some thought needs to be given around the options and shares that are now being realized by your employees which is a great thing of course but also additional thought about those new ESOPs for the public company because the private ESOP probably and generally isn't appropriate post listing and finally for those of you who uh, buy shares in ASX of course the tax comes down to stamp duty transaction costs and then later revenue or capital gains tax on those disposal points as well um, now I mentioned before so back in I think it was 2014 don't quote me on that I try to rub it out of my memory these days but we set up BMG <laughs> USA uh, in Wyoming we set up it as a LLC which at the time sounded amazing the corporate veil had never been lifted in in the US at all um, now for ourselves attractive as directors to mitigate our liability as best we could not that we're up to anything you know it's too suspicious and so um, Josh just to jump in there could you just touch on what a corporate veil is for maybe some of those that may not be familiar yeah sure so basically one of the advantages Rachel mentioned before about being a company versus being an individual is that asset protection benefit yes directors always have liabilities including trading and solvent etc but basically if you satisfy those director obligations for the most part you are immune from company debts except where you make personal guarantees etc now in the state of Wyoming 10 years ago don't quote me on this now that had never been lifted for any reason and so it basically gave directors really strong uh, protection and we see similar provisions over in Delaware where a lot of our uh, high growth venture clients uh, grow to as well of course so that was very very attractive for us so we looked at that and thought we don't need advice we can go on the internet and we set up an llc which is a limited liability partnership not a company which is a c corp now an llc in the us can elect to be taxed as a company which is fantastic the issue we made as fairly young and green founders at the time was we then appointed some us uh, cpas as our tax advisors got really great advice but what we didn't do was get advice about a global structure so we had Australian operations and tax problems <laughs> not really problems but implications and US and we didn't really put those together we looked at those in silos and so from a personal perspective when we did start generating revenue and ultimately um, transacted at the end of the business that created a few little headaches for us to deal with and in hindsight I, I wish I'd done that differently next time um, and certainly would have made it easier at the other end as well so hot tip from me um, get it right it doesn't have to be over complicated but don't complicate your life with <laughs> problem. <laughs> amazing thank you Josh thanks for, for sharing your experiences on that um, you actually touched on ESOPs and Ian in our most recent conversation you touched on um, ESOPs from the 
from your perspective, as it is something that you and your team sort of get asked quite often by founders what that picture could look like. So hey, maybe you're happy to throw to you and go from there. Um, yeah, we, uh, we we get asked uh, a lot about ESOPs, uh, whether we can uh, provide liquidity uh, to employees who are direct beneficiaries from, from the ESOPs. And the simple answer is you know, we're not uh, tax experts. I think uh, other people on, on this webinar are far more uh, accomplished at that than I am. But we, it's, I think the, the message is that we do buy employees uh, shares that are vested via an ESOP. So once a, uh, an employee's title becomes uh, clear to, to uh, a share or uh, some other similar instrument in the company, um, we're able to buy them. So uh, vested shares coming out of ESOPs are very valuable. Um, some of our portfolio companies use uh, the, the, the fact that second quarter is an investor in their hiring deck. And the reason they do that is because a lot of employees like the idea of an ESOP, but don't like the idea of waiting 12 years for some theoretical uh, exit event. The idea that uh, a company is thoughtful enough uh, to actually go out of its way to have somebody there to ostensibly help their employees along the way with liquidity is often um, seen pretty pretty well. It's actually something that, um, that I, I never expected second quarter to be in the hiring deck of some of our portfolio companies. It was never something I, I, I expected, but um, I can think of at least two portfolio companies where there's an entire page dedicated to us. Wow. And I imagine that's to your point before, Ian, that's such a value prop for a startup to involve in your business to give their employees some flexibility around what that might look like, as opposed to sort of staying with the business until the next big cap raise or, or an eventual exit down the track. I think so, um, and even even from the lens of look, if you if you've got an employee interviewing and they're really good, that maybe they're interviewing at I don't know zero or WiseTech or some other uh, technology company, Google, uh, Microsoft, all of whom have relatively liquid mar markets for their for the stock they earn out of their their ESOP. You know, you've got to be able to sort of compete with the talent, and and having having uh, at least thought about liquidity for employees. It doesn't get you all the way there, but it really shows that you're you're thinking about it. Amazing. And Mark, I might actually hand over to you around all things ESOPs. Was it a very smooth sailing experience when you were growing your last venture around ESOPs, or did you uh, have a few learnings from that as well? Yeah, I mean, when when I first got investment, I had no idea what an ESOP was. Um, but uh, we had one because um, our VCs gave us that guidance and helped us do it. But I think it is a game changer where, I mean, we exited very quickly. It was four years, so people didn't have to wait long. Um, but for those companies that are 10, sort of 12, 15, I think it is a game changer where you can offer some form of exit without that event being an IPO or acquisition um, to show thank you to those early stage um, team members. So I think that's huge um, and definitely something I'll keep an eye on as we go through. But we've got ESOP structures set up now. Um, and yeah, it, it's there to thank those people that took that chance on your company um, that probably didn't take that chance on that well-paying job, but they believed in your vision and what you were doing. But an exit event for them faster than 10 years is always nice. Mark, can I come in and ask you? Am I allowed to ask a question, Fabio? Yeah, please jump in. Ask, you know, Go like, for it. So, so Mark, you know, you're a successful founder, and we've, you know, we've got a, a whole lot of founders uh, on this webinar right now, and where you know the message is get yourself sorted, uh, put up your structures, think about tax ahead of time. This message is one of 500 that founders have got to deal with right now. You know, there's it takes time, and the founders have got so many things. They're putting out fires. They're building markets. You know, you went through that. Um, how did you just get it done? Just given the, the amount of workload you had at the time in the early days. Yeah, I think the challenge with that is it became important enough. And the problem with that statement is it only becomes important enough when you've got to make that decision in the next sort of 30 days. And then you go talk to KPMG and say, hey, I need this done in the next 30 seconds sort it out um, and then you get a thousand questions and that's when it becomes important i think um, something i mentioned at the start founders you know a lot of those successful ones aren't really thinking about themselves they're thinking about everything else that has to happen so um, 
as painful as, as it is, it's probably one of those things you set up. I saw a question there, like when, when should you start setting up international structures? I mean, and that's always like when, when you have those really truthful conversations of are you really scaling internationally or are you a great Aussie business or Oceanic or, or what is that? Um, you know, and is an exit really on the track? I mean, I used to make statements about technology of, yeah, we'll deal with scale when it happens. Um, and scale happened very, very quickly. And every engineer I've ever worked with have said, I told you so. So the tax structuring is the same. Scale will happen. Um, I think you mentioned it yesterday when we were speaking that a lot of startups aren't getting in, uh, a lot of founders aren't getting into this not to be successful. The whole intent is to be successful at whatever that vision happens to be, either financially or they want to make an impact on the planet or put a bit of both. So, you know, I would argue it's probably everyone on this call that's something you should set up now. Um, I don't work for KPMG, so I can say that. It would definitely <laughs> be something you set up now um, and take that time out of your day because I promise it will impact you at some point and it will be too late. Uh, it's one of those scale issues with your engineering teams. You always kick them off. I kick the can down the road. Other might, people might be far better founders than me, um, but you're always dealing with scale. And this is one of those scales. Amazing. I think that's such, such a good lesson, Mark. Um, to your point before around the international piece, Rachel and Josh, I might hand over to you as we've had a couple of comments around what that should look like. We hear it all the time from founders around if they should flip up because an investor or US investors potentially putting a bit of pressure on them. They're doing more activities overseas. They're, they're getting customers. They're hiring in different markets. Is there any sort of high level guidance that you could provide a founder as they're starting to think about what that international structure could start to look like? Rachel or Josh, which of you want to jump on this one? I was going to throw to Josh. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think like I'll start and then Josh can round it out, I think. Um, if we think about your Australian structure, again, it just comes down to the flexibility of, of where you want to get to and if overseas is it. Um, one of the other things to think about if you're going overseas, what are you doing personally? Are you staying in Australia? Are you thinking about moving to the US? We then start getting into the realms of talking about residency um, and where you might sit as, a, as an individual. And that, that can um, change things um, as well. So yeah, I think there's lots of things to think about and I think it's hard to do it in a webinar, but I think it's, it's just having the right conversations at the start, identifying where you're gonna go. Josh can obviously talk to the going to the US. Um, and and yeah, I, th I think it's, it's just, just, I think the best piece of advice is just don't do nothing and, and have the right conversations at the right point in time. But I'll, yeah, Josh, happy for you to continue on that thought. Thanks, Rachel. So I think there's only two things I want to add to that, really. Um, and the first is whether you, whether you physically need to have a company or structure inside the US or a different market to operate or sell to that market. So, for example, um, if you need boots on the ground, people there, then yeah, you, you probably do. Um, but for a lot of tech companies, you don't. You can have an Australian company and still sell to US customers from Australia, um, from New Zealand, wherever you are. So always, always think that through carefully. You don't want to overcomplicate your life. You want to make sure that, you, that the structure you've got supports you because it is a compliance, it is a cost, and it is a time, like it's a burden. So make sure you've got what's fit for purpose and what supports you in that sense. In terms of that specific question around flipping up to the US, it's a question that comes up, I reckon, weekly from our clients um, that we work with, as a lot of them do look to the US market, which is obviously one, very attractive, massive, um, and the feedback we get um, from many of our advantages, they really like talking to VCs and investors in that market specifically because they, they understand, particularly in client tech. However, US investors almost always say, we want a US entity so we can invest in our jurisdiction. Now, we have seen some success where the founders push back and say, no, you can invest into my Australian head co. And if you want in, that's what's happening. And we, we, we might have a US subsidiary, which is going to be the operating entity over there. But our IP, our R&D, our existing shareholders are here in Australia, and it makes sense. And that can work. So don't be scared to push back because you can certainly get foreign capital coming into Australia. Where we do see flip ups, often that happens at, at, the, at the final point. And to the point that was made before around 
do you need to go to the US or any other market and when's the appropriate time? So it's important to think that the two key failure points that I see, the first is that end of proof of concept. So you get this amazing piece of kit, there's an awesome bit of tech, but then really struggle to commercialise and get that product market fit. Once you push past that and people are paying for it, you're making money, the next question becomes, when and how do we scale? Where do we go? And that is a big decision. It is often also a big failure point in terms of the sheer cost and distraction to actually physically grow into those markets and really succeed versus do we go narrow but deep here in Australia, New Zealand, or do we go overseas or you know wherever our market is? So I'm not saying don't do it by a long way, but be really strategic about what and how you do it. And Mark, curious to hear from your perspective, you've dealt with a whole range of different types of investors and Ian, I'd certainly encourage you to jump in as well. Do you still see that pressure in the market? Do you see other founders maybe taking that leap a little bit too early and maybe not really thinking through the consequences good enough or well enough? Rob? Yeah, I think Josh said it well. You can run a um, company from Australia if you don't need those boots on the ground. And a lot of the times you can um, do everything you need to do from here. Um, I, I, I've definitely seen um, pressure to be in the US to get US investment. Definitely seen that. Um, but again, it just depends on uh, the founder and, and the startup of can you push back and say, look, this is how we're going to set it up. This is what we're planning on to do um, and your willingness to uh, roll the dice and see what happens. But um, so there's always an option and, and I've found all the investors I've worked with have been super flexible on making sure that, you know, it's working for the business. So they're not going to do things that are um, going to hurt hurt what they're trying to invest in. Yeah, amazing. Thanks, Mark. Ian, did you want to jump in there? I wasn't sure if you uh, had something to comment. Yeah, um, I think, well, certainly from our perspective as uh, as a venture capital investor that just happens to invest by secondaries, um, we have, in terms of international expansion, we have similar views to, to many VCs. I think the there are many Australian companies that underestimate uh, how difficult it is to enter the US market uh, and also to some extent the UK market. Um, I remember speaking to my co-founder at Second Quarter, um, Lee Jasper, uh, about this. Lee, Lee was the, uh, the, the co-founder of Aconex and he grew that business uh, to be in 60 offices worldwide and sold it to Oracle uh, a few years ago for I think it was around about $1.6 billion. So built a very big software company from, from scratch and one of his biggest markets was the US. And he said way back in the day when they moved to the US, they just couldn't believe how hard it was. They had to, they'd never thought about it. They thought cultural similarities would help. Uh, it's the opposite. Uh, there is far less of a cultural similarity than he believed. He had to de Australianize everything, even, even to the extent of uh, making sure that all the uh, S's in you know, words like stabilize were replaced with Z's and all that sort of stuff. Um, also, uh, he, he felt that in many ways that they underestimated the true extent of competition in, in the US. So, relative to uh, competing in uh, the US market, competing in you know, the home market of Australia was a walk in the park. Um, there's way more competition, uh, especially in, in sales uh, in the US. So, um, you know, I see the same thing in the UK as well. Um, it's a slightly different market. So I, I can't approach it from a structuring perspective. I sort of think about it from a commercial perspective. Um, and I, I also we see in times of these times where capital efficiency is quite important, it can be quite expensive to um, to expand internationally, but on the flip side, it also can be quite lucrative if done uh, very well. Fantastic, what a great, great uh, anecdote to, to finish up on in, much appreciated. And maybe on that note, I would like to say a very big thank you to all of our panelists this afternoon for sharing so many insights. Um, Ian, if people would like to reach out to you to ask you or your team any questions, would you say it's via your website? What's the best way to, to get in contact? Yeah, via our website. As I said um, previously, um, we, we, we actually do uh, read what's submitted on our website. Um, um, the other thing I wanted to add is, uh, you know, I always try and give something actionable uh, to everyone. I think we've spoken about a whole lot of stuff that people need to think about it. I think it sort of falls into that broad uh, administrative bucket, which is not always top of founder's mind. Um, just I'll mention two things. Uh, if you're a founder looking at ESOPs or if you're looking to uh, educate your employees about ESOPs, um, there's a fantastic blog 
post uh, by Alexi, the co-founder of Eucalyptus, which many people would have heard of. Um, it's If you just Google uh, Eucalyptus ESOP, you'll find their blog, and there's a fantastic uh, piece about some of the issues around that. It's entitled, Read This Before You Accept an Equity Offer as a Startup. It's aimed at employees, but really very helpful for founders. Um, the other resource I think that is really good is go to Airtree. Um, they've got a fantastic website and they've got this part of it called Open Source VC. There's loads of templates. So from, you know, uh, advisor uh, document templates uh, through to ESOP templates, all that sort of stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff there that could shortcut a lot of this admin for people. Amazing, thank you, Ian. And we'll make sure we include those links as well in the follow-up um, email to, to everyone that registered and also a recording of the session. Um, we'll also include um, the Hydro Ventures contact details if you would like to have a conversation with Rachel or Josh, and um, they're also happy to take a bit of a deeper dive into your own personal circumstances and obviously company circumstances. It's something that we do all day, every day. We're all too familiar with it here uh, at KPMG. And Mark, again, really big thank you for taking the time to join us. And uh, if there's anything you wanted to end on, uh, please feel free. Uh, nothing from me, but always, always around the help if I can. Amazing. Thank Amazing. you. Perfect. Well, thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks, Fabio. Thank you for having us.